All right. Well, good evening, everyone. We are uh, super excited uh, for tonight. We have a, uh, a different format tonight. If you're uh, wondering, like, am I at the right church? What happened to that guy over there? There's two. <laughs> um, you know, as I was sharing with you guys, um, you know, we were going to do something much different for our uh, Sunday night service that we have here. And so I am, I'm super excited to have uh, a, a guest, a friend of mine. We've done this before on Pastor's Perspective a couple times. And um, I was thinking about, you know, we're at Easter and, or Palm Sunday, and there's so many things happening that I'm like, you know, let's do something different that will kind of um, encourage us as believers and even non-Christians, if you're here and you're not a Christian, uh, we're just going to talk about the historical Jesus. And we're going to look at the, the, basically the events from Palm Sunday throughout the week into, um, you know, Friday and the weekend, which is considered the Resurrection Sunday. And so, um, you know, Dr. Joe Holden is here. He's going to be part of this whole conversation. I'm going to be asking him questions, and I'll be carrying a conversation with him uh, throughout this time. So um, thank you for being here today. It's good to be with you, Robert. So what we're going to do is um, I want to start off with a video. So if you guys can play the video, we'll start this as an introduction. Historical figure? I don't know. <laughs> I think he was just a person. I don't know. Just a normal person like us? He was a selfless person. I have no clue. He was a man. I think he was marketing genius because he got people to believe him. I don't, I don't think he's the son of God. I don't feel believe that at all. If David Copperfield was in the day of Jesus, he would be Jesus. I'm pretty sure he existed. Like, I'm not going to say that he didn't exist. He was God's son, but so was Gandhi, and so was Muhammad, and so was, you know, we're all God's children. Jesus is someone I pray to. Well, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, um, and he, to me, is the like symbol of just ultimate forgiveness and ultimate love. He's sort of that like constant figure in my life. Jesus is also Isa in Arabic and he was a messenger as well. He was just extremely enlightened like religiously and morally. Was somebody that um, just tried to um, impart wisdom on others and um, make the world a better place. I think he saw something that a lot of people didn't see and still don't see in others and I, I think that's just a lot of love and, and hope. Jesus sort of seemed like an ominous uh, figure. You know, he just, he, he was God and it was hard to relate to him. But I think as I've grown in my faith a lot, I've really started to see Jesus as my closest friend. You know, Joe, we're Palm Sunday. And, you know, when we think about Palm Sunday, we think about Palm Sunday and we think about Easter. And everything in between gets kind of fuzzy. Yeah. We forget that there was a lot of a lot of things that really happened during the life yes. of Christ, and that final week of Jesus when he was on this earth before he went to the cross. Um, you know, right now schools are, are celebrating spring break. You know, it used to be called Easter break, right? And uh, spring break, and so a lot of schools are out. People look at this time for vacation. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when, when I was in a Christian, one of the things I enjoyed about spring break was just go and party. You know, you don't That's think right. about what went on in the life of Christ, of course, to be not, not being a Christian. Um, but one of the things that I see during this time, and, and perhaps you can talk a little bit more about this, is that um, liberal scholars will tend to come up with shows, uh, documentaries on the History Channel, uh, different uh, you know, places on television, where they begin to try to debunk the historical Jesus. They, they, they purposely wait for this time. And I kind of did a quick little search on what's out there right now or what's mm -hmm. been out there. Uh, some of the titles that some of these secular historians have done, uh, yeah. one title is called Secret Lives of Jesus. Another one is Who is Jesus Christ? Uh, another one is called The Jesus Strand, A Search for DNA. That's another popular one. They're trying mm -hmm. to find Jesus' DNA. Yeah. Uh, one is called Lost Worlds, Jesus, Jerusalem, Jesus, Jerusalem. And then recently, Rob Bell came out with this documentary, this thing about his life, and he's calling it The Heretic. That's the, mm -hmm. the, the commentary or the, mm -hmm. the documentary. And he's explaining why he believes what he believes. Mm -hmm. And he's one, obviously, we know that has always tried to reduce the Christian faith. And mm -hmm. so some of these things that are happening, I mean, what, what do you see in your profession when it comes mm -hmm. to this time in, in liberal theologians? 
Well, it, it seems like when you look at the academia, you look at universities, you look at uh, some seminaries, even some seminaries that are Christian seminaries, they are talking about things that are all about the historical Jesus. And as Robert said, you know, the historical Jesus is the real Jesus that lived in time and space history 2,000 years ago. It's not the one we read about in the scriptures. You see, for you and me, we don't have to go look for the historical Jesus because the historical Jesus is already in the text. So there's an assumption that lies at the heart of the search for the historical Jesus among these scholars today, and that is that this isn't enough. This is only footprints in the sand, and footprints in the sand can only tell you something very limited about uh, what we're searching for, maybe the height, the weight, the size of the foot of the person walking on the sand on the seashore, you know, and that's how they approach Jesus. And that's unfortunate because these are the most well-attested documents that we have that tell us about Jesus. In fact, Jesus is mentioned in over a dozen extra biblical documents as being a real historical person. And it tells us a lot about him. Now, what do you do with the a person who claims to be an atheist and they say, well, you know, I don't believe in the Bible. Um, and therefore, I don't believe that Jesus was a real person, probably the result of a combination of stories uh, about several individuals. Hmm. What, what, how do you reach an atheist during this time when they're denying the fact that Jesus actually ever lived on earth? Sure, that's a great question. Um, how many of you have talked to an atheist within the last year or two? Okay, even though atheism is only about 2% of our population here in America, in large part, the further east you go, especially into Russia, you're going to get more atheistic worldviews. But the best thing to do with atheists is to discover what kind of atheists they are. There's either soft agnostic atheists, which means that, simply this, that I just don't know, and therefore I haven't made a decision on the issue. And then there's the hard agnostic atheist that says, you can't know, and we definitely know there is no God. Now, everybody heard of Richard Dawkins, maybe Christopher Hitchens, Michael Martin, and some of these other atheists. Those are what you call hard agnostic atheists, and they would take a different response than the soft atheist. The soft atheist, it's great to deal with that kind of person because they're open. It's the hard atheist that poses a threat to Christianity, and we can take their arguments uh, one by one based on whatever they bring up. Mm -hmm. But keep the discussion on Jesus and the intellectual and evidential support that undergirds the whole Jesus story, especially the Passion Week and the Resurrection. Now, what if, uh, let's say, you know, you establish the existence of Christ, and, and I think most secular historians, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, <clears throat> they know that a man by the name of Jesus lived on this earth. I mean, yes. there's no denial. If they're really honest, they know that, yes, a Jesus lived on this earth. Yes. Uh, the question is whether he is God and whether he rose from the dead and all of right. that, right? But there is also another group of people that will deny the crucifixion. Mm. You know, I, I read something recently that said there's no evidence that the Romans crucified prisoners 2,000 years ago. How mm. would you refute that? Well, I, first of all, I would say, let's go look at the Roman documents and see what they say. These are extra biblical Roman historical documents that were written shortly after the crucifixion of Christ. Let me give you an example. There is an author named Suetonius. He's a Roman historian. He works for the Roman government. And he tells us that Jesus was crucified under the reign of Pontius Pilate, the prefect of Judea. That document says it and spells it out. In fact, it even says this whole Christian superstition arose again in Rome in the later years after he was put to death. We also can go into Jewish literature, even the Talmud. Has everybody heard of the Talmud? It's a Jewish piece of literature that talks about their traditions and their different belief systems. And even in that document, it says that Jesus was hanged on a tree on the eve of Passover. So that tells you that Friday, Jesus was, was crucified. Hung on the tree doesn't mean with a rope. It just means nailed to a tree, a cross if you will. So, so now that we've established the historical Jesus, you know, we know he died on the cross, I, I want to look at 
this, this final week of Jesus. You know, yeah. I want to see what, what, what went on. And, 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 and so I want to take a look at this because I think uh, looking at it from a chronological order, I think helps us out Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Sure. Uh, you know, Matthew chapter 21 verses 1 through 11 kind of mm -hmm. gives us the triumphal entry. And I want to start with that. Today's Palm Sunday. We yes. celebrate Palm Sunday. Um, you know, there, there's a date that comes to mind, March 29th, AD 33. Mm -hmm. uh, how accurate is that date? Uh, most historians will say this is the date that, that all this happened. Is, is that accurate? Yes, it, if, if it's not, it's really close to it. I mean, we have different uh, dates out there. Some say 29 AD, some say 30, some say up to 34. But the point is that if we see this as a historical, what we call synchronism, that means that you know there was a historical event that occurred here and it follows the biblical progression the dating in this area makes it plausible of your belief. It makes it reasonable to assume that that date is it or right around in the immediate vicinity mm -hmm. of it. Okay. So the dating is pretty pretty firm. Pretty firm. There's okay. not too much flexibility there. Now, as, as we go on into the story, you know, here's Jesus. You know, he tells two disciples, go and get a colt, yes. you know, and tell them, you know, if they ask you, what are you doing? You know, my, the Lord is in need of it, which is kind of ironic that Jesus is in need, right? right. It's, we're the ones that are always in need. <laughs> and so, um, so, so we come to this place and, 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 and they go to the, get the, 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 the occult and all. And so, you know, we have what we call traditionally Palm Sunday or Passion mm -hmm. Week as we're in. Why do we call it Palm Sunday? Why, why can't we call it anything else? Well, well, we can call it other things, but traditionally it's been called Palm Sunday because the people who received Jesus into Jerusalem riding on that young donkey were laying palm branches down on the ground so the king of kings could uh, ride on top of the, the palm branches. So the first order of business was, do you have a jacket? If you have a jacket, you want to lay it down on the ground in front of Jesus as he's coming by on the donkey so he can walk over your jacket so he doesn't have to walk on that dusty road. A king deserves to walk on royalty. So the people were actually throwing down their jackets and when their people didn't have them, they would go get the palms from the trees and lay them down instead. Hence the term Palm Sunday. Jesus rides into Jerusalem. And this was fulfilled just according to Zechariah 9.9 that said it would. It's another fulfillment of prophecy. So why palm branches? Palms are, are awesome. I, I love palm branches because in, in the ancient Near East, those branches were symbolic of, of life, of nourishment. Um, you get dates from palms, remember. Uh, you have, uh, they're also typical of what you call a broom. And a broom is to sweep out dirt or things you don't want. And when you find out when Jesus goes and cleanses the temple a couple days later uh, in Matthew 21, you're going to see that he's going to sweep out the leaven from the temple, which is another picture of how we practice the Seder today. The Jewish families, they get rid of all the leaven in the house. They sweep it out. Well, that's what Jesus is doing in the temple along with them. Does that make sense? So, so you have this huge procession, this parade, yeah. if you will. Mm -hmm. it, it was almost like they were giving Jesus a red carpet kind of uh, red carpet experience, right? Receiving. Here's Jesus coming through, and uh, people are singing Hosanna, shouting Hosanna. And yeah. so as he's walking through here, I'm sure a lot of things were going on in the, in the minds of the Romans because the Romans understood what it meant to see a king come through with, with the way they did parades, which was a lot, a lot more, mm. uh, you know, um, I guess uh, the experience was a lot more vibrant, I guess. It was yes. better than, than what, what they saw. And so when the people laid the branches on the ground, what were they expecting? I mean, were they really embracing Jesus at that moment as the, 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 God, the Son of God from heaven, the Messiah, or, or were they thinking of something else? You know, to me, I don't want to add or take away from the text. It seemed like they were giving the red carpet treatment to Jesus, and they were receiving him as the long-awaited Messiah. Now, those things change in just a matter of hours and days when he said, boy, I, wish I would have gathered you as a hen gathered her chicks, but you would not, it says. So the obstinance and the fickleness of the human nature would certainly play itself out. But at this point, it seems like the people was receiving him as such, as the Messiah, the long-awaited Zechariah 9. Mm -hmm. Were they thinking of more of a political leader, perhaps, more than a, a spiritual king, somebody coming in, bringing in the, the kingdom of God? Because I know they were yeah. under the oppression of the Romans, right? Absolutely, no doubt. When people look for a Messiah, traditionally it would have been, this Messiah should be riding on a stallion you know, decked out in armor, drawing the sword because 
this Messiah is going to take us away from the domination of Rome. Remember, Rome had their boot on the Jewish neck at that point in time. And they were looking for Jesus to overthrow, and he would take over the kingship. Get rid of the emperor, get rid of Herod, get rid of you know, Pontius Pilate, and you got it made. Jesus is going to be our next king, politically. Unfortunately, they misunderstood the whole story leading up to this point. Even the, even the disciples had a little problem remembering certain things, didn't they? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, the other question is, why a colt? Why not a mm. horse? Wow. Hey, horses, that symbolizes warfare. That symbolizes strength. But when you ride a colt, and now remember, a colt is a young donkey, okay? And most likely, that young donkey that Jesus was sitting on uh, was accompanied by the, the female donkey, the mother donkey, or else the little donkey probably wouldn't go. It would be very stubborn. But sitting on a young donkey, it, it, it tells us that Christ the Messiah was humble. The humility he's coming in and the, uh, the lowliness he's coming in and the softness he's coming in is trying to send a message. I'm not here to be your warrior, political warrior, Messiah. I'm here to be your meek, your mild, but strong Jesus, your spiritual savior. And ultimately, those warrior things will take care of themselves in time because he will come back in the second coming as a warrior, won't he? Riding a white horse and the name written on his thigh. What is it? King of Kings, King of Kings Lord of Lords. That's right. And he's going to take care of business. So the first coming was the cross, humility. The second coming, he's coming with the crown in fierce judgment. And all this was a prophecy, like it says, Zechariah 9, 9, which I'll, I'll read this for those of you who um, are watching. Uh, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation. Is he humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey? So that's a prophecy that was obviously mm. fulfilled. This was something that Jesus was fulfilling in their eyes, in yes. front of their eyes. I mean, they, they, they had no clue what was happening. Obviously, they were looking right. for a political uh, Messiah, helping them to get out of the oppression of the Romans. Mm -hmm. And they began to shout, Hosanna. Mm -hmm. what, 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 is, what does Hosanna mean? What does that word mean? God saves. Save us now. God saves. Uh, Savior. It all has to do with that spiritual context of saving me. Save me, Lord. You are the one that's from on high coming to save us as the lowly Messiah. Please save me now. It has everything to do with justification, forgiveness of sins, and ultimately salvation before God. Now Psalm 118, 26 says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Is that any significance to Palm Sunday or to that triumphal entry? Yeah, absolutely. The scriptures, as you know, you're well aware of this, there's no wasted words, and God doesn't waste a sentence. He doesn't waste a word, and they're all perfectly interconnected. And when you talk about the psalm passage, this is the fulfillment of what was told about much earlier. In fact, we don't even want to stop at psalms. It goes back further to uh, Genesis 3.15. That's called the Protoevangelium, the first mention of the gospel. It says, the seed of the woman and the seed of the servant are going to have a little battle, aren't they? Now, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the seed of the serpent, but the seed of the serpent, Satan, will bruise the heel of the seed of the woman, the Messiah, Jesus. And this is the week we're talking about, that battle. Jesus would crush the head of the serpent, and ultimately he would have to give his life, his heel. In other words, it wouldn't be any uh, forever moment. He would rise three days later. So it is the fulfillment of the very first mention of the gospel. And that's what's so exciting about this, Robert, is that everything is coming to pass just the way the Lord said it would in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. uh, we could take Psalm, we could take Genesis, we can do Daniel 9, 24 through 27, the 70 weeks. It's all coming to conclusion right here. So is that why we call it the triumphal entry? Yes, yes, absolutely. It's like the king has come and you give a king a parade, right? Well, this is exactly what's going on here is he's triumphant and God's word has come to pass. We are celebrating because God is faithful. He has provided a savior. So that yeah. was a Sunday. That was something Sunday. that went on. Mm -hmm. All this stuff went on. And now moving into Monday, and I know chronologically yeah. we can be off on some of the events there in Matthew 21. Um, you know, some scholars believe 12 uh, verses 12 uh, through 46 
you know, it's, it's, it's Monday, and, and a lot of things happen there. Jesus cleanses the temple. He leaves Bethany. Uh, he curses the fig tree on the way. So a lot of things were going on on that next day after yes. Sunday. What else was going on as Jesus was heading towards that cross? Well, first of all, he, most likely he was staying with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. That's most likely was his home while he was there for this week in Bethany. That was on the east side of the Mount of Olives. Has anybody been to, to Israel, the Mount of Olives? Maybe you've uh, gotten over to Bethany. It's on the east side. It's on the other side that does not view the Temple Mount. Well, since it was the Passover week, the population would swell to perhaps over a million people in this small city. And those who have been there know how small this is. This old city would swell and you'd have to do this, you know, get through people and, oh, excuse me, you know, and, and, and really try to work your way through these crowds. And there was a lot of preparation. There was a lot of anticipation of what's going to happen with the, sacro, uh, the, the Passover and the Sabbath, the high holy day that was coming near. So a lot of preparation was going into here. And Jesus was teaching. He went into the temple. He was teaching. He was preparing. He's teaching his disciples these little lessons about the fig tree and the cursing of the fig tree and about faith and so forth. And it's just an amazing time this Monday is because we take one further step closer to get to that Sunday morning. Yeah. And one of the things Jesus did during this time was that he actually, he, he wept, like mm. you said earlier. Mm -hmm. He wept over Jerusalem. Uh, Luke 19, 41, 42 says, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Yes. That, that, that hidden from your eyes, what does that mean? Did, did yeah. God purposely hide this from them, mm. or is this something that happened in their own heart? Yeah, it, it, remember, God wants your eyes open all the time. So we know it, was, it wasn't God trying to close eyes to see his provision, his Messiah, his son for these people, but it was a blindness in accordance with the people's will. In other words, sometimes we just don't want to see something Maybe we're looking for something we want, right? We've all been there, I think. We want a powerful warrior savior that's going to get rid of Rome. We don't have to pay taxes to Rome anymore. We want liberation militarily. And so people weren't seeing Jesus for really who he was, what he was, and what he came to accomplish. So mm -hmm. unfortunately, the blindness was in accordance with their own will. Just like Pharaoh. Remember it said, and God confirmed Pharaoh's heart, and he hardened Pharaoh's heart. That way, Well, the hardening of Pharaoh's heart was in accordance with Pharaoh's decisions and his will. It wasn't against his will. So do you think that the crowd that was here saying Hosanna most likely was almost the, pretty much the same crowd that said crucify him? Mm -hmm. That yeah. here they're going from Hosanna, mm -hmm. save us now, to kill him. To kill him, yeah. right? And yeah. that's the, the flightiness of, of, of crowds, right? You have them exactly. hooraying you and then I don't like you kind that's of right. thing, right? That's right. Fickle, the fickleness of of people, right. generally speaking, because a lot happened between that Sunday triumphal entry and then uh, the Friday crucifixion. You know, Jesus went in and cleansed the temple. He upset, ultimately, the, the whole city about doing what he did. He did something almost sacrilege to the people and began believing that false story that the Sanhedrin and the religious leaders were putting forth about Jesus, namely that he's a uh, he's into the magical arts, and he's a blasphemer, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Which leads us to Tuesday, yes. which where Jesus in Matthew 23 and uh, chapter 24 and 25, uh, he confronts the hypocr hypocrisy of the Jewish leaders. Yes. Uh, obviously, they didn't like that Jesus was presenting an authority that was above them, mm -hmm. and so they set out to just destroy him. I think, I think that was a, a, right. one of the verses there, I think, in the Gospel of Mark. It said that they, they actually made it their, their goal to try to kill him, right? But right. they couldn't because of the crowd. What, why was that? Well, there was enough people who believed that Jesus was the Messiah still left. And secondly, there were, there were also, you know, do you want your religious leaders seen killing somebody who just recently was received like a king on Palm Sunday? It just wouldn't go over well. Obviously, they'd suffer a public relations nightmare and a meltdown if that ever happened. They wouldn't be able to justify it. Because there was just too many people who saw miracles up to this time, and they weren't going to allow it, or at least let them off the hook for doing something like mm -hmm. that. Okay, yeah. so let's move into Wednesday, Matthew 26, mm -hmm. 14 through 16. We see Judas is bribed. I mean, some say it's, it would happen on Tuesday. Some say it was uh, 
you know, Wednesday. But but Judas, mm -hmm. and that week, and this week, uh, he was he bribed he was bribed by the religious leaders to betray Jesus, and so this was also a day that was the preparation of, of the supper, of uh, the Last Supper. And right. um, do you know from, from your studies that middle week of this Passion Week, uh, some say it was like a silent day. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Judas was being, you know, prompt to, to betray Jesus. Yes. But nothing else really went on. Um, it was more of a preparation. Is there any other things that we could be missing on that middle of that week? Not really. It was Judas making arrangements to get his money, his 30 pieces of silver for betraying Christ. Uh, he was trying to get the plan together to go get Jesus. And Wednesday was the last day that you really had to prepare for the Passover meal, which would be celebrated on Thursday after sunset. So Judas was a busy guy at this time. And Jesus knew what he was up to. Obviously, he said, you were a devil from the beginning. So he had no illusions about what Judas was up to or what kind of person he was. But this is called the silent day, as Robert said. And it's interesting because we don't learn much in the Gospels about Wednesday of this Passion Week, even though you can see the bun hear the, the drum beat just getting louder and louder and the anticipation really coming to fore here. In fact, John's Gospel uh, really emphasizes this last week very powerfully because he dedicates nine of his 21 chapters to the last week of Jesus' life. Not, that's almost half the content of his gospel is dedicated to this one week. Uh, we think we know uh, John's emphasis here in his gospel. I think we do. It's about Jesus and that sacrifice he'd make this final week. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so as we get into Thursday, Thursday is, it was a big day. Big day. You know, Last Supper, uh, Judas betrays Jesus, uh, Peter's denial. And so here now he's getting, he's approaching that, that day of death, the crucifixion. Yes. And so... You know, Peter, John was sent to make preparations for the Passover mm -hmm. meal and all this stuff was happening. Right. And so here's Thursday, the betrayal, the denial. You could imagine, you can only imagine what was going on in the mind of Jesus as far as the, the, the stress and, and, and what was coming. Um, can you comment a little bit about this, this full day of Thursday and, and with, with the high priest, the Sanhedrin? I mean, so much was going on at this time. Well... It's, it's getting darker and darker. The storm, storm clouds are coming in rapidly, and Jesus is feeling the pressure. Um, the Bible says he sweat great drops of blood as he agonized and prayed to the Father while the disciples slept. Doesn't that add to your agony? You know, your best, your best buddies, you know, right there. <laughs> They're sleeping while you're going through all this turmoil. You're about to carry the sins of the world on your shoulders and bear them upon you, and you knew what awaited you. Lord, if this cup could just pass... Take it, but nevertheless, let your will be done. And Jesus was obedient uh, to the end. But Peter here is denying him three times during this time. Um, Thursday was an amazing time because Judas is going to eat the Passover meal with Jesus and the disciples after sunset on Thursday evening because that really ticks it over into Friday, which is Passover now, as soon as that sunset occurs. And Judas goes out to betray him they finish their meal, and then they cross the Kidron Valley and go up into the Mount of Olives where the Garden of Gethsemane was. Now, if you've been to the Garden of Gethsemane, you still see all those great olive trees there today. Perhaps some of them were there when Jesus was there. But that was the place where he would be finally betrayed by a kiss of Judas. He'd be taken into custody, and he would be then put forward and put through six different trials over the next several hours, which was just amazing and excruciating. But if you want a, a, a parallel, in the Old Testament, it says that David escaped across the Kidron Valley at the time that there was some insurrection and his kingdom was under threat by his sons and by the people who wanted to take over the throne. So it was almost like a mirror replay of what David went through was a picture of what Christ is going to go through in the future. And this week actually brings that to a head here. So Very that brings us to Good Friday. Good Friday. And uh, mm -hmm. the question that I have is why Good Friday? We know it was a oh. bad Friday, right? It, what was good about the Romans torturing Jesus? It was called Bad Friday for Jesus, but Good Friday for us. He gave it all that we might live. That's what's so great about Good Friday. It's Good Friday because it's good to have salvation. It's good to have your sins forgiven. It's good to have uh, all this sin problem be put away once and for all for anybody who would receive Jesus. 
they can go to heaven. That's why it's so good. And that's the great message of the gospel, isn't it, Robert? Amen. Yep. I mean, the resurrection and the crucifixion, the payment for sins was incredible. 1 John 2, 2 says, He not only died for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. He was the propitiation or the satisfactory sacrifice that made Friday so wonderful and so good. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, amen. Now, um, when it comes to the crucifixion of Jesus, I mean, there's, there's a debate uh, among us Christians and scholars, and mm -hmm. uh, he, got, he died on Thursday, it was Friday, and they come up with all these different things. I just, I read this article from this scientist uh, from the University of uh, Oxford, and uh, it was published a few years ago, and he said this, that, uh, that the evidence strongly points the exact day was Friday, April 3rd, A.D. 33. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on that? Because I know others will believe it, it was Jesus was crucified on a, on a Thursday. Yeah, that's a great question, Robert. We know Jesus was crucified on a Friday because John 19 says he was taken off the cross and he was, and he was on the cross on the preparation day. That word preparation is a Greek word. It's called periskue. Periskue. Even the modern Greeks today use periskue as the sixth day of the week, which is Friday. The seventh day is Saturday, and the first day of the week is Sunday. So even modern Greeks are telling us, but if you go over to the passage in Mark, actually, I'll give you the exact passage in Mark. If you go to Mark, let's see here, chapter 15. Don't crucify him. Verse 15, gratify the crowd. Look through chapter 15 on this, and let me see here. I want to make sure I'm on the right one. But yeah, oh, 1542, there it is. Now, when the evening had come, because it was the preparation day, the same day John uses, says preparation day in John 19, that is the day before the Sabbath. What is the day before the Sabbath? Friday. So Friday he was crucified. Even modern Greeks use the same Greek word, periskue, today. So Thursday was a preparation day. Sunset, Friday was Passover. Sabbath was Saturday. Jesus definitely died on a Friday. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another thing is, um, you know, some, some Christians will ask, well, where in the Bible does it state that we're to you know, uh, remember Christ's death by mm -hmm. honoring him on this, on a Friday or, or Palm Sunday, whatever. It, it, what would you say to that? Well, when we remember Christ's death, we take communion. We take the Lord's Supper. It was the Passover meal on Friday where the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper. It was the Passover that was the backdrop to say, eat this bread. This is my body that was shed for you. And drink this cup, for this is my blood that was shed for you as well. So the Lord's Supper has an intimate connection to the Passover meal. In fact, back in the book of Exodus, when they put, remember the blood over the doors, and the angel of death would pass over those homes that had the blood when they were there in Egypt in captivity? Well, that worked itself into the law, ultimately to the Feast of Passover, and the Passover has now changed hands and it's now placed into the Lord's Supper. So the Lord's Supper is a profound moment here where Jesus makes the connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament, or the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And what is the crux of this new thing? It's Jesus the person. His body, His blood, and Jesus the person. It's no longer ceremony. It's no longer ritual. It's no longer types or shadows. It is the person live and in color in the flesh right here on Friday. Okay. And so continue on with our Friday. I want to look at the mm. seven statements uh, that Jesus made on the cross. Uh, there are really interesting statements, and I want to kind of go over these, and, and I want to hear your take on some of these because I know that, you know, some, there are a lot of questions and some of the, the statements that he actually made. Uh, but before we get into this section, I just wanted mm -hmm. to just take a quick little break and just want to let people know that, yeah. You know, you're the president of Veritas, uh, uh, was it? Uh, International, International University. Because you know, I'm so used to Veritas Seminary. Seminary, right. But now it's, it's changed. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about 
that school and sure. what we were talking in the back about some interesting things that are happening. Sure, absolutely, I'd love to. Veritas International University was originally founded under the name Veritas Evangelical Seminary. I've been the president of that school, the university now, for over 10 years since its founding. Dr. Norman Geisler is the co-founder of the school. We focus on archaeology and biblical history. We offer degrees, bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees in um, <laughs> apologetics, defending the faith, biblical studies, theological studies. And we're located right in Costa Mesa on the same block in the Logos building right next to Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. Um, all of our board members are Calvary Chapel pastors for the most part. I'm a graduate of Calvary Chapel Bible College. I went on to get my PhD at the University of Wales, Trinity St. David in, in Europe. And it's been a wonderful 10 years. God has really blessed. We have graduates from all over the world. We have distance learning programs. We have residential programs. And get this. Since we just added an archaeology and biblical history PhD and a master's degree in that subject, we are now partnering with Trinity Southwest University to dig up, archaeologically excavate, the biblical city of Sodom. We are in our 13th season digging that city up, and what we're finding will blow you away. We're finding melted pottery. You know how hot it has to get to melt pottery? Thousands of degrees Fahrenheit. And those kilns or ovens back then, they couldn't get that hot. Something fiery and very hot happened there, just like the Bible says it does. It did. And we're in our 13th, and we're really rewriting all the Bible maps and charts books because of what we're finding there. The chronology is changing. We're in the midst of a big revolution when it comes to getting the accurate dating that really follows what the Scripture actually has said. You know, a lot of these liberal scholars, they write their books, and then every time we finish a dig, they have to either burn their book or edit it severely or just say, I give up and just throw it away. You know, you know what I mean? And that's, you know, I'm sorry about that, but that's the way it goes when truth, uh, you meet truth face on, you know. So wonderful things are happening at Veritas International University. If you want to learn more about us or maybe even take a course, um, in fact, I'm teaching a course on the nature and character of the Bible. It's called Bibliology. Uh, April uh, 18th, 19th, and 20th, uh, right there at the campus there in Costa Mesa. And you're more than welcome to sit in for personal enrichment or audit or take it for actual graduate credit. Uh, go to VES, that's Veritas Evangelical Seminary, VES.edu. You can find out all about our programs, more about us. I think it's fascinating just to hear about the excavations yeah. of Sodom and, yeah. and you know, um, to know that the, 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 the Bible, our faith, our Christian faith, is an objective faith. It is. It's, it's not a history. subjective. It's mm -hmm. not how I feel, what I think. It's, it's objective. And, and, you know, you have manuscripts. You have uh, archaeology and yes. prophecy that That's just right. confirms that what we read here is the actual Word of God. Actual. You know. Boots on the ground, real yeah. life, historical Christian faith. In fact, all of you can participate in the Sodom dig. We need volunteers every year. We go from January to the first week in March. You can stay for five days, ten days, two weeks, or three months. Um, you can stay the whole time. We train you in archaeology, and then you actually dig up biblical history there. I took my two sons. I went twice. I've taken my two sons both times, and they've found jugs. They found carbonized grain in these huge storage drugs, jugs in the palace of King Bera. You know who King Bera is, right? He's the king of Sodom back in the book of Genesis. So all kinds of great stuff being found there. I my mean, kids love to dig. Maybe they'll help. They would love it. They would love it. Bring them on they over. dig holes in my backyard like <laughs> moles, you know? <laughs> Incredible. That is just, it's fascinating. That's, that's one of the things that I think being a Christian, mm -hmm. uh, the confidence that we have yeah. that, that we're not, you know, believing in this make-believe God. You know, and if you're here tonight, you're not a Christian. I mean, the Christian faith is an objective faith. It's not a faith that is based on feelings or, I mean, there's evidence in, in, in what we believe. And that's the exciting thing. Because the Bible, you look at the book of Acts, bunch of cities, bunch of geographical areas. Yeah. If, if the Bible was going to be debunked, it, it would have been right there, right? That's Even right. in the Old Testament. That's right. Because archaeology wouldn't be able to find mm -hmm. these cities, these places. And we know that obviously that's it's true. In fact... The book of Acts, it's funny you brought that up. Acts is a book that 
actually leads the scholars. And what I mean by that is Acts uses terms and phrases and, and locations and titles that nobody ever heard of before. And they were claiming that Luke is a bad historian because we don't have any evidence of all these terms and, and titles. For example, Luke calls the rulers of Thessalonica polytarchs. That's the Greek word he calls them. He uses, oh, these guys are called polytarchs. We don't have any record of polytarchs being used of anybody in the whole world, especially in the, the ancient Near East. And what they found were, when they dug up the city uh, not too long ago, they found 19 polytarch inscriptions. Three come from the first century when Luke and Paul were traveling together. So it's just, and then what do the liberals have to do? They have to get their books, <laughs> go back to the drawing table. <laughs> okay, or, or even uh, the, the language spoken in uh, Troas was Lyconian. Luke was the only one that knew that. Nobody knew that, and they were busting Luke's chops about that, and we found out the language spoken in their area was Lyconian. You know, so Luke, amazing, amazing historian. God chose the right person to write that book. Wow, yeah. incredible. All right, so, so let's, let's get back to the, to, to the Good Friday. Friday. Uh, Jesus made seven statements uh, from the cross as he mm -hmm. was there dying. And so the first thing he said is, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Why did Jesus say this, and who are they that in this passage? Father, forgive them. Who, who, who are they? Who, who are those guys? Well, they would be the world in a broader perspective, but it would be the Romans who crucified him, but we all put them on the cross, right? I mean, technically, we all put him there with our sin. He had to die to forgive sin. So he's saying, forgive them, the religious leaders who unjustly accused him, the Pontius Pilate, the Roman government who unjustly condemned him, uh, the Roman soldiers who nailed his hands and his feet uh, to the cross, and to the people who shouted, crucify him. They don't know what they're doing. But that takes a big person to say that. Father, forgive them. After all this, my beard has been plucked from my face. I've been spit on. I've been hit. I've been whipped to almost to the point of death. I couldn't even carry my own cross to Golgotha to be crucified on it. Simon the Cyrene had to help him. It takes a large individual to be able to say that when he's being crucified in his undergarments on a thoroughfare outside the city as a common criminal but yet, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He's saying we're blind and we don't understand the significance of that day. But ultimately, people will. That's why we have over 2 billion Christians on the planet today, because people's eyes were opened, because the Holy Spirit opened their eyes. Just amazing. So Jesus was crucified. Uh, he was, you know, with, with thieves, thieves both criminals. Sides. And he said... To one of them, today you will be with me in paradise. That's right. Uh, two questions that come to mind. One is, what is paradise, and why didn't Jesus say, today both of you will be with me in paradise? Interesting. Do you know that paradise is a Persian word, and it means an enclosed, well-watered garden? That's what it means, paradise. Paul tells us where paradise is. He says it's in the third heaven. He said, I was brought up into paradise, into the third heaven into paradise. The first heaven is where the birds fly, our sky. Second heaven is space, the terrestrial, the, the, the planets. The third heaven is God's domain. That's where we go after we die, right? Okay, that paradise is where Jesus, and some people say the thief, some people say both thieves, but if the word says both thieves, then both thieves are going. They're going to this perfect place of bliss, this well-watered garden, if you will, the place where there's no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears, no more grief, no more death and darkness, no more sin. Today, this very day, why could he say that? Because he paid the price for the sins. What an amazing statement that was. Yeah. Another statement, Jesus looks down and says to uh, Mary, woman, Behold your son. This is in John chapter 19, verses 26 and 27. Uh, what, why is Jesus saying this? Well, Jesus is hanging on the cross, and it's getting to the end. You know, it's almost 3 p.m. in the afternoon. He hung on the cross from 9 to 3. And he's basically transferring um, Mary, his mother, over to John. 
the disciple, most likely, it was John that was there, saying, hey, she's, he's going to treat you like a mother and you treat him like a son. But he also could be implying that, hey, behold your son on the cross. Here I am. You know, take a good look because though you may be weeping now, you won't be weeping in a few days because he knew what was going to happen. So shouldn't our eyes always be beholding Jesus? We should always be beholding what he did for us on the cross. As soon as we lose track of that, that's when things start to fall apart. We lose perspective, and we just don't get it. But ultimately, he wanted to take care of his mother. He wanted to take care of John. He wanted John to take care of his mother. And this all played into the context of seeing what was happening to Jesus on the cross. So, woman, behold your son. Or, madam, behold your son. Here's one that I think we have a lot of questions Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mm. Matthew 27, 46. In what sense did God mm. forsake his son? Mm. Interesting. This is a passage that's been debated for a, quite some time. And Jesus is actually quoting a psalm here. And he's basically saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, remember, Jesus was a man, wasn't he? He was 100% man. He was 100% God. He was the God-man. They call that the Theanthropos. As a man, Jesus felt forsaken on the cross. Probably as many of you have, even walking with Christ, maybe say, God, where are you? Have you abandoned me? Have you left me? I'm in a desert here. I feel like you're nowhere to be found. But God has not left you. He is certainly there. He promised to be with you to the end of days. He will never leave you nor forsake you. As you read through the end of of that psalm in the Old Testament, you find out it also claims, but you are there and you've heard me. So it implies that in reality, God the Father did not forsake the Son, though the Son did feel forsaken as a human being, like many of us would in times of trial like that. Now, if there was an actual forsaken, it would be a momentary turning the back on the sin that Jesus was bearing. There wasn't a separation between the divine persons. The Son and the Father, there can be no separation between the Son and the Father. But there can be a momentary separation between the human Jesus and the human nature and the divine Father because of the sins he was bearing. And that was just the penalty for bearing the sin of the world that we should have taken. You see, we should all be separated from him forever for our sins. But he made it possible that Jesus would take that upon him so we wouldn't have to be separated or forsaken by God. What a great moment that was. Mm -hmm. You know, a sobering moment right. of which all time is measured in A.D. and B.C. Mm -hmm. It's the pinnacle of time right there. And, and, and the scripture that he was referring to, is that Psalm 22? Yes, Psalm, psalm 22. 22. Yeah. That's, that's considered a messianic psalm, Yes, right? it is. Right. Messianic psalm. Go read it. Read it over and over. It's just a beautiful psalm. It lets you take a peek inside of the heart, the feelings, the emotions, and the mind of Jesus on the cross some uh, thousand plus years uh, before he ever came to die. Just amazing. And, and even before crucifixion was ever... That's right. Right? That's right. right? That's right. Because crucifixion came by way of the Persians. And the Persians taught it to the Romans. And then Constantine outlawed that in the, in the third century, uh, early fourth century. So there was no more crucifixion after that time, the Edict of Toleration, by about 310. But it was a horrible practice. It was designed to make the person suffer beyond, beyond even thought. I mean, it was, you suffocated basically. You had to keep pushing yourself up to get air. That's why they nailed your feet and your hands. And then that's why they would break the legs why not the arms or just spear them? Well, they break the legs so they can't push themselves up to get oxygen anymore, and they just asphyxiate uh, ultimately. So it was a horrible, shameful death, uh, but Christ did it for you and me, even though he could have walked off that cross at any time. He stayed there. And that's why I believe in him, because he stayed there when he didn't have to. He could have got off, and people were saying, well, what, he can't even save himself? Let's see if he saves himself. Well, they don't believe him because he didn't save himself. We believe him because he didn't save himself. You know, it's just the polar opposite. So. 
And, and the Romans, uh, you said, you know, the Persians were the ones that kind of put this, you know, they, they came up with the crucifixion. When the Romans came and, and they were taught to the Romans, the Romans mm. actually made it worse, didn't worse. they? Yes. They wanted to prolong the agony and the suffering. Remember, Romans uh, are not just these men wearing miniskirts or something like that. <laughs> they were pro professionals at killing. Okay, they were professionals at killing. And they want you dead, you're going to be dead. Um, and that's why we know that Jesus did die on that cross. Uh, how do we know? Because the Bible says blood and water came out where the spear had pierced his ribs or his chest. In other words, the Journal of American Medical Association said the fact that blood and water came out of his side was evidence that he already suffered like a heart rupture or the pericardial sac around the heart had already ruptured. He was already dead at that time. And that's why we know Jesus actually died. And that's an important point because if we want to make sure that Jesus died at that moment because you can't have a resurrection if somebody didn't die. So Jesus did, in fact, die. Yeah. And he also said from the cross, I thirst. Yes. I mean, here's his moment, moments of death, mm. and he says, I Me thirst, too. like you, you know, drinking right now. <laughs> was Jesus fulfilling a prophecy by saying this? I thirst. I'm sure he was. Um, he got thirsty. He was a human being, and he thirsts, but I think there's even more to it. I, want to, I don't want to discount the, the historical sure. aspect to it. Certainly, as a human being, it was hard work dying from 9 to 3 in a very agonizing way, and there was thirst. But he also thirsts for righteousness, doesn't he? For all of you and I. I mean, that's what his thirst was. Remember in John 4 when he said, I have food you do not know of that I am eating? when the disciples went away to go get um, food and rations and so forth, he's saying, I have food you don't know of. I've been eating that food. And he's been drinking that drink ever since. <laughs> and that's the spiritual food and the spiritual drink that sustained him ultimately. And then he says, of course, it is finished. It is finished. What a powerful phrase. Now, the Greek word is instructive here for us. It's, it's important that we realize this. The word is called tetelestai. Tetelestai in the Greek text means paid in full. They actually used tetelestai to put on bill of ladings on invoices back in that day. They just rubber stamped it, tetelestai, when they paid it in full. So Jesus is using an accounting phrase to say that all the work that he was sent here to do, his death on the cross, is now finished upon his death. There is no more to add. There is nothing to take away. And when he says something is finished, why should we add any works to his finished work. It's done. Only believe by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone. That's what he calls us to do. Yeah. And the last thing he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. What was Jesus demonstrating when he said this? Into your hands I commit my spirit. A total yielding and an offering of himself to the Lord as a sacrifice. Do you know to put yourself in somebody's hands is like the ultimate devotion to somebody. You know, take me, Lord, I'm yours. Do with me what you want. You know, Romans 12 is very instructive for us, isn't it? It says you're a, a living sacrifice. It's your reasonable service to offer yourself as such. So to in your hands I commit my spirit was God uh, or Jesus was saying, hey, I'm dying. Lord, take me. You're in sovereign control. Take my spirit. Take my soul, take all of me, and it's yours to do what you want. You're the potter, I'm the clay, take it. So what a wonderful, wonderful lesson it is for mm -hmm. us to yield. Mm -hmm. That word yield is very powerful here because if you yield to the Lord, you know, your, your life is going to take a great change and a great turn. I mean, we often pray, Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit, but maybe we should be praying, Lord, Help me to give more to you so the Holy Spirit can use me. Because the Holy Spirit is here and he wants to use you. But some of us are like cups that are turned sideways and not turned upside to be filled to overflowing uh, in that manner. So God here is, or Jesus is yielding his spirit to, to God himself. What, a, what an act of devotion. And so looking at all of this, all these statements and what Jesus went through, yeah. I mean, it, it shows us that, the death of Christ was not an accident. No. Right? Because some, some believe that this man came to earth, lived a good life, and shared some good moral things, and then 
all of a sudden he gets ransacked by the Romans and they killed him and bummer, he's dead yeah. now, right? Yeah, it wasn't accident. like that, right? No, this was purposeful. In fact, the Bible says he was slain before the foundations of the world. And then the prophets foretold of this Messiah that would come. Isaiah 53 says he would be bruised, he would be pierced uh, for us and our iniquities and our transgressions. So the prophets played a very important role to overthrow the argument that Robert just, you know, Jesus was caught in this unfortunate circumstances and it wasn't really planned out. Well, the prophets foretold of every event to its minutia and its detail to how many pieces of silver he would be betrayed with and so forth. So this was no mistake. It was the greatest empire in the world with the greatest jurisprudence who condemned Jesus to death. Uh, this was no kangaroo court per se. This was the Roman government. A few other things here, because we're going to wrap it up here yep. in about five minutes or so. Um, a lot of things happen after this. Uh, Luke 23 to 44 says, It was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Now, mm -hmm. some theologians uh, have assumed that a solar eclipse occurred during this time. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on this? Um, first of all, a solar eclipse can't really happen on a Passover. This was actually brought up. The ancient historian Thallus said... Well, this, the darkness might have been due to a solar eclipse, but Julius Africanus, which is a Christian historian, re rebutted the whole thing by looking at astronomy and so forth where, where eclipses never really happen on Passovers. It, it just can't astronomically occur at those times accordingly. So he basically debunked astronomically why there couldn't be just an eclipse. Mm -hmm. Oh, and isn't it an eclipse? that it just so happened to be right at the time the Son of God is dying on the cross. I mean, come on. <laughs> the preponderance of evidence is no. It was a, a divine cosmic action by God. So yeah. Jesus dies. He's buried. Sunday, we celebrate here a week from today, resurrection. Here's where the secular mind has a problem. Mm. I believe in your Jesus. I, I, I get it. I, I see what he did. He yeah. came to the cross, whatever. Yeah. But for you to say he was God and for you to say he resurrected, here's where... The secular minds have a problem. I was reading this article. BBC News came up with this, uh, came with this, out with this article uh, that, that stated the resurrection did not happen. Says a quarter of Christians. <laughs> Yeah. And, and here's a quote, what they said, a quarter of, of people who describe themselves as Christians in Great Britain do not believe in the resurrection of Jesus, a survey commissioned by the BBC suggests. So here's where they come out of the woodwork, right? This mm -hmm. is the week that we celebrate the resurrection yeah. of Christ. Um, in fact, one liberal pastor said this, and I want to quote him. He says, so to ask an adult to believe in the resurrection the way uh, they did when they were at Sunday school simply won't do, and that's true of much of the key elements of the Christian faith. The resurrection. How do we, in a, in a one-minute uh, brief synopsis, how do you convince someone of the resurrection when we weren't there? Well, there's so much historical evidence to suggest it actually happened. Number one is there's nearly a dozen eyewitnesses that he personally appeared to within 40 days after he rose. In fact, Acts says he presented himself by many infallible proofs during those 40 days. That word infallible is like incontrovertible proofs. We're talking, hey, Thomas, touch me. Luke 24, here, I'll eat a piece of broiled fish so you see I'm a real human being that came back from the dead. Uh, Mary appears to Mary. She thought he was the gardener, but here he is uh, appearing to him. Appears to Thomas, to all the 12, by the time it's done, these are primary source eyewitnesses recorded in Scripture, and any legal uh, mind, even uh, the Harvard professor Royale of law, Simon Greenleaf, everybody heard of Simon Greenleaf? He even put the rules of legal evidence to the test, and he analyzed the statements of Jesus and the resurrection, and he concluded that any court would justify that a physical resurrection actually took place. I mean, when somebody rises from the dead and you have eyewitnesses to prove it and you backed it up with miraculous acts to confirm who he was, that person has instant credibility in my book. I don't know about you, but instant mm -hmm. credibility if somebody rises from the dead. And then yeah. as, as uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, but Christ has indeed been raised, raised. from the dead. And that's, that's, right. that's the Christian faith. Without the resurrection, we really don't have a faith, right? Don't have a it's gospel. It's the capstone of the Christian faith. That's right, because I chuckle when, they, when you say Christians who deny the resurrection. 
Well, the, ne the whole definition of Christianity is Christ died on the cross and he physically rose from the dead three days later. So whatever Christian they are, they're certainly not a uh, mm -hmm. historic biblical Christian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's amazing mm -hmm. uh, what, what can be argued yeah. and so forth. Just well, let, let's amazing. end with this. I, I want you to talk directly to the person uh, who is not a Christian. Perhaps mm -hmm. they're in this room right now. Okay. They're watching on webcast. Oh, okay. Talk to them now that we've talked about the whole week of Christ, how important yeah. Jesus is. Just give them a, a quick little encouragement. Sure. What an important week this is. Everybody lives by faith in something. We live by faith sitting in this room, having faith that the roof won't collapse in on us. We have faith when we start our engine in the car, we know we're going to get to work. Or when we drive over a bridge, we have faith that it'll support us. Everybody has faith. The real question is, what is the object of your faith? Is it your bank account? Is it your car? All those things will let you down, elicit relationships. I mean, all those things will let you down. But Christianity is called a historic Christian faith because it's rooted in reality. We have eyewitnesses. We have manuscripts. We have archaeological data. We have scientific data. We have all this evidence to marshal that being a Christian is reasonable. Now, I take the survey a lot. How many of you became a Christian because it was a contradiction and unreasonable? Everybody became a Christian because it was the reasonable thing to do. It made sense. And yes, you take a step of faith, but we're not taking a blind leap of faith in the dark. We're taking a step of faith in the light of the evidence. And Jesus left us more than enough evidence. The only thing that remains now is, are you convinced? to take that step of faith, that free step of faith that says, Jesus, you're my Lord and my Savior. I give you myself. Thank you for forgiving my sins. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and that you physically rose from the grave three days later. You're saved at that point. There is nothing unreasonable about that. Even scientists and atheists live by faith. They live in faith of their knowledge. They trust their knowledge in their, their, their scientific inquiries and their testings in the laboratories. They live by faith in that they should write their journal articles honestly and truthfully based on the knowledge that they've received. Everybody lives by faith. But what is the object of your faith? That's the key. And hopefully it's Jesus Christ because it's him alone and it's his name is the only name under heaven whereby we must be saved. And that's it and we're taking a step of faith in the light. So I encourage anybody and everybody, if you're not saved tonight, grab a hold of Jesus and never let go. He'll always be there. Joe, thank you so much for taking the time to come out yeah. here and to sure. do this, uh, this talk. My it's, pleasure. it's been very encouraging. I hope you guys were blessed and, yeah. and it was very Lord. insightful thank in you. all the things yeah. that you shared. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you much. Father. Don't forget that as you guys walk out to my right here, the Veritas uh, table is there. If you want information, you can talk to Vanessa. Um, or perhaps, are you going to be out there? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'll, I'll be out there. If you guys want to talk, yeah. ask him any questions and all, that'd be yeah. great. And uh, I'll hand it over to uh, Jarrett. God bless you guys.